challenges of displacement and forced migration for Eastern and the Horn of Africa include one, the protracted nature of most of the displacement in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we're talking about displacement that um, has happened um, uh, in Sudan and South Sudan before the cessation, uh, but that for most South Sudanese uh, refugees, for instance, continues now because of the eruption of uh, uh, conflict in December 2014. And, and th this has meant that in the Horn of Africa we have refugee caseloads that are longer than 20 years. And the question is then, how do you deal with such a caseload that has been there for, for so long compared to uh, refugees from emerging uh, conflicts? And th there has been also a challenge in terms of the policies in place because they are, they are made in such a way that one policy fits all. Uh, most of the countries in the Horn of Africa practice uh, an encampment policy with the exception of, of Uganda. So refugees live in camps and, and so when refugees have been displaced for 20 years and they still have to live in camps, that can be, uh, that can be quite a challenge. Two is um, also an emergence of many, of, of many conflicts. We've seen um, uh, the conflict in Kenya in 2007-2008 that led to displacement. Uh, we have seen the reemergence of conflict in, in South Sudan as well. And recently we've also seen uh, hostilities between Eritrea and, and Ethiopia. And that will certainly lead to uh, uh, new refugee numbers or, uh, in the region. Uh, thirdly, is th there is a general feeling in the Horn of Africa that um, the displacement situation has been forgotten, especially recently in light of other emerging uh, emergencies around the world, Syria being one of them, and that has also practically seen the reduction in um, financing. We've had cases when refugee populations go without food in the Horn of Africa because this world, well, the World Food Program really has, has, has no money at all. And, and that then increases the vulnerabilities of those displaced. And once people are vulnerable, then when they become further vulnerable to trafficking, for instance, they can fall prey very easily to, to people, you know, to extremists. You know, you just need to give someone who has not had a meal $20 and they're willing to do, to do anything. And, and that also poses a challenge then for the countries that are hosting them. Because what do you do when you're hosting half a million people who do not have access to food, they, can, they don't have access to, to basic services. And in countries where the refugees have been allowed uh, social, access to social services like Uganda, that there is a strain on those resources because uh, the, in, in the initial place they were planned for the local populations, but now they have to be shared by almost at times four or five times the number of people for which there were plans. So, so that, those are some of the key challenges um, um, uh, regarding displacement and forced migration in Eastern and Horn of Africa. But in the Horn of Africa, um, one of the key issues that countries now are starting to discuss and act on is integrating a service delivery for both refugees and host communities. Um, so that at, as, at the national planning level, when we plan for education, we don't just plan for if a country has 34 million and far, half a million refugees, it is consciously planning for 34 million and 500,000 people. That is, that is what actually gets the resources and the action to the ground. This, of course, comes with its challenges because these, uh, um, you know, refugees are seen as the responsibility of everyone, of the international community. And so it is also having um, refugees integrated even into development um, uh, blueprints adopted by international organizations. For instance, through the UN, uh, the UNDA, the UN Development Assistance Frameworks, that usually feeds into national development blueprints. Uh, you know, the question is which comes first? Is it the national development blueprint that integrates them or is it the UNDAF that fits into that process? But it could be both ways. It's also bringing out these issues within um, uh, the UNDAF processes and it will also provoke governments into doing this. I would like to give a, a classic example of how this has happened in the area of health. For a very long time, uh, refugees did not have access to, to especially HIV uh, 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 therapy in the region. 
at the regional level, IGAD developed um, um, a health program that was targeted, it still is there, that is targeted on ensuring a systematic conscious access to um, ARVs for, for refugees and migrant populations. And this means that if someone is coming from Ethiopia and they cross the border to Kenya, they have a card that allows them to access health uh, within the Kenyan system and even if they go to the next uh, other country using that card. And, and with so doing, it, one, it brought out the fact that refugees had not been thought of in planning, in the national development planning in regard to health of the countries. And as they became conscious of this, now we see that increasingly the program of um, access to uh, HIV uh, ARVs has been expanded in most of the countries to include uh, to include refugees and migrants, and I think this would be this is a good example that could be taken to other sectors, including uh, education, but also um, increasing the scope for livelihoods for for refugees. Because when they're self-reliant, then their vulnerabilities are reduced. It makes it much more possible for them to return when they have a skill, when they have some uh, some life savings that they could use on return. And it also helps them to contribute to, to post-conflict reconstruction in their country.